past three days, I've shared with you the topic of pray then like this, the Lord's Prayer, which is the most important teaching of the Sermon of the Mount. We learned the importance of praying for His kingdom to come. Starting today, we're going to focus details about the kingdom of God so that we can have a better understanding. We're going to look at the biblical theology of the New Testament the next couple of days. We're going to learn to see God's kingdom through a biblical perspective. As you know, I preach a lot of sermons. There's a difference between giving a sermon and teaching. So I'm going to try my best to present the findings of biblical scholars to you. I pray that His Spirit will use me as a channel to share His Word with you. Please pray for me that I may only be used as a, as a device to deliver His message. After that topic, we're going to talk about other topics that will lead us to change our view of the world and it will bring restoration and healing to you. God's Word has the power to heal and restore everything. Because you realize who you are before God. I think at the end, we will know how to live our lives, life resembling the Lord's Prayer, and that will restore our spirits. Some of you may feel bored when we learn about the theology, which tells about God's sovereignty from the Garden of Eden to Revelation. However, this truth is the master key that will open your eyes and understanding of the Bible. When this happens, we gain the ability to see the world through God's kingdom. You can take what is written in the Bible and compare that to the world and a better understanding of things that are happening. Then it will enable us to have the ultimate truth and live according to that. This also helps to review our hearts, why we have hurts and pains. And this will also change our view on, ch on church. Changes our view on fellow brothers and sisters. We do not assess the situation from our own perspective, but assess through the Holy Spirit. Then we turn our focus to outside of church, communities around church, outside of church. Then a church becomes a mission church. This will be explained by Pastor Sun, who will speak for our summer mission conferences. Then you will realize what it means to live a missionary life. In Greek, God is a singular noun. I share with the members of discipleship training. God is not a plural being. He is a singular being. The Trinity is one. I pray that through and after the 40 day, 40 day revival, the Holy Spirit will convict and challenge us. This is the vision I have. Let's not dwell upon our feelings and inequality, inequities or challenges ahead of us. This cannot and will not be a hindrance for God's kingdom to come. Let's move away from consumer mentality. We have a long way to go, a long way to go. But we will take little steps during the 40 days of revival. Let us dwell in the truth throughout the 40 days. Hallelujah. Let us encourage one another so that we can finish this well. I have a present for you. There is a mathematics equation that represents God's kingdom. Once you take a look, you will realize that this math equation truly shows God's kingdom. I really hope that you will remember it. Let's, t let's take a look at the first one. God, uh, good minus God equals zero. Even though there are good things in the world, without God, it is nothing. What is G-O-O-D, good? We always try to live for the best. What is the answer of good minus God? It is zero. Is there anyone who is wondering why it is zero? You all know it, yes? G-O-O-D, take away G-O-D, is equal to zero. What does that mean? Even though there are good things in the world, without God, it is nothing. Didn't the Apostles Paul say all things he achieved are considered rubbish? Pre-Christ, he chased after the good things. He reached the top, but he desired for more. We all are like that. A rich person like Rockefeller once said in the interview that he wants 
a lot of money. He wants a little more. We are all like that. When there is no God present in our lives, the result is nothing. This is the math equation of God's kingdom. Hallelujah. Isn't it correct? You will come to a full understanding when we go over the culture of Cain, the Tower of Babel, etc. This world's kingdom is nothing because God's presence is not there. Now then, here's a second mathematical equation of God's kingdom. Zero plus God equals good. Even though our lives are worthless, zero, with God by our side, it will be a beautiful one. What do you see? Our lives are nothing or worthless, and you add God, and what do you get? Good. The result is good. G-O-D. Even if we are uneducated and have nothing like the fishermen of Galilee, when Jesus becomes our king, and we live according to God's will, then we will live the best life. Not just good, but great. We will have the best life. Beautiful life. God will change our lives to a life of praising and thanksgiving. Please remember... That G-O-O-D minus G-O-D is zero, but zero plus G-O-D is good. Hallelujah. I've been a Christian since my mother's womb. You all know my testimony. I went to church all my life. I had a solid belief on the doctrine of Christianity. I had no doubt that Jesus was my deliverer, Savior, and Lord. I thought that was everything about being Christian. I thought faith was all about believing in Christ and going to heaven after we die. I thought this world was just a place that I live in. As you know, my father was a poor pastor, and after his death, I experienced financial difficulties. I was poor, but became even more poor. So my mother started working in a textile factory, and I worked in a dangerous neighborhood. As I grew up, the desire of becoming rich consumed my mind, heart and mind. I am going to be an important person. Those were what I wanted the most. I did attend every Sunday service and try my best not to miss any Sunday. I believed in Christ and worshipped Him. However, from Monday to Friday, all I thought about was how to become successful and make more money. Went to UCLA, majoring in economics because I wanted to make a lot of money. I never thought it was wrong to think like that. That was my core value and how I saw the world. I didn't realize that my faith and worldly perspective were in a separate compartment. I could have lived and ended my life just like that first math equation of God's kingdom. However, Christ came to my life and met me. By God's grace, I was able to meet Christ personally. I didn't know what I was doing back then. It was kind of embarrassing to repeat after the pastor's prayer, but obediently, I did so, and that changed my life. After listening to my testimony, he said he was once like me. He believed Jesus as his Savior and Lord. He was a president of a youth group during his middle school and high school years. He was a member of the church choir. He served church for many years, but Christ was not present in his life. He then shared what it means to have Christ as Lord and King in my life and what it means to become the follower of Christ. He said, Brother Hakjin, you have, you have to accept Christ as a king over your life. He encouraged me to pray with him that I want Christ to be the center of my life. I didn't know what it meant exactly. He told me that handing over the ownership of my life to Christ is acknowledging Christ's lordship over my life. I had a general understanding, but still fully grasped the idea of how it related to my daily living. But I said, yes, I will do that and pray together with him. He also said to lay all my burdens to Christ and ask him for the guidance of every aspect of my life. So I said, yes, I will do that. I profess that Christ is now a king over my life and my Lord. Then things started to change. Well, the situations didn't change. My circumstances, situations, struggles stayed the same, but my attitude towards my circumstances changed. Instead of worries, I had peace and comfort in my heart. What were you thinking about when you praised, come now and be seated on the throne? 
Just read the lyrics. Be seated on the throne. Who was on the throne in my life? Me. I was sitting on the throne in my heart. What I did was step down from that throne and knelt before Christ, who is now sitting on the throne. What amazes me is that after I gave the lordship and ownership to Christ, peace and comfort took over my heart. I was truly in awe of his grace when I praised him. I was in awe when I read the word of God. I felt so strange. The more I praised him, the more peace I had in my heart. The things started to change around me. People who saw my changes spoke a lot of encouraging words to me. Christ led me step by step to be closer to God. It was later in my life I came to a full realization of what it means to live for his kingdom. My life completely changed. It was different after I handed over my life's control to Christ. God led me to the second math equation of God's kingdom. I had nothing. I was nothing. I was just like the fishermen of Galilee. But after Christ became a king over my life, I achieved things I could never dream of. The testimony of God leading my life is present to you now. How did I become a person who would lead and preach the kingdom of God for the 40-day revival here at NYPC? Every time I think about that, I am so grateful for the privilege and the honor God has bestowed upon me. It's not because I have the abilities. I am nothing. Jesus is everything. I really get blessed. Preparing and preaching for the 40-day revival, I spoke to my wife that I am so blessed since all my thoughts, mind, and heart are focused on the kingdom of God. I get so passionate and thankful that God put me in the pulpit to preach his kingdom. This is a privilege. Dear brothers and sisters, I pray and hope that we all live the life of the second math equation of God's kingdom. Let's review God's kingdom and its truth through that equation and come to an understanding. May the Holy Spirit plant that truth in your heart and mind today. Let's take a more detailed look at the glory of the kingdom of God, especially the books of the Gospels. And afterwards, from Genesis to Revelation, focusing on God's promise and his covenant. Let's look at it from a biblical theology point of view. We read God's word from the book of Mark and Matthew this morning. We read it. They contain the same message. Mark is written by Mark and Matthew is written by Matthew. These two are part of the book of the Gospels. The three books of the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, illustrate the same incidents and same message. The book of John is different from these three books. John writes about Christian life and Greek culture. However, the book of John talks about the gospel message. So the author of these books, these two books, were spirit-led and recorded them. Mark refers to the kingdom of God and Matthew refers to the kingdom of heaven. Let's read the scriptures one more time. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus proclaims the truth to the heavens and the earth. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's read from Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark described it as the kingdom of God and Matthew described it as the kingdom of heaven. When we look at the original meaning of kingdom, Mark and Matthew use the same Greek word, basileo. However, Mark uses theos when referring to God, which has the same orig origin of theo in theology. In Greek, theos means God. When both use the same word, basileo, to describe the kingdom, but use different second words, but, but use second different words. Mark uses theos, and Matthew uses uranos in Greek to describe heaven. Uranos in Greek means heaven. I think English translation has a more clear distinction. In Matthew it says the kingdom of heaven, and in Mark it says the kingdom of God. We can conclude that these are correct translations. Just a side comment. Mark and Luke 
do not use the word oranus. They, the word they use in Matthew, in Mark, Luke, John, and Acts are Basileo Theos. Matthew is the only one who uses the word oranus, described as heaven. Do you know that the word heaven only mentioned is only mentioned in the book of Matthew in the Bible? The, the book, book of Matthew is the only book that uses the word heaven. Isn't it surprising that our utmost interest is about heaven? That it only it's only mentioned in the book of Matthew. You can Google it and find out. I Googled it too. I searched the word heaven and it only comes out in the book of Matthew. No other books in the Bible mentions it. The word heaven only appears in the book of Matthew. The only exception is 2 Timothy 4.18. It does mention heaven in that verse. Otherwise, no other books mention it except Matthew. Only the book of Matthew uses Vasileo Oranos, the kingdom of heaven. So when we think about the idea of heaven, we refer to the Bible. When you think about heaven, you think about the sky, yes? We think about the sky when we think about heaven. I used to think that, like that, that heaven is the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that exists in the sky. I'm sure that many of you have the same concept of heaven as me and exercise your faith. When we think about heaven, we narrow it down to a place, a location that is unknown to us, but we will live there forever and ever. It gave us hope to live in the midst of hardship. That was the motive of serving at church and enduring all the hardship because we're going to live in heaven after we die. We often relate heaven to a special location that we are going to enter, hence the term kingdom of heaven. I am not chastising you. There is a vivid contrast to people who have their hopes in heaven and people who do not. The hope of heaven gives us strength and, per and, and praise. Hallelujah. I am not dismissing the hope in heaven. It is a crucial part of our walk in faith. Yes, there definitely is heaven. Of course there is. It is so precious. But we need to know the truth. The gospel means Jesus. When the book of Acts and all of the books of the Bible mentions heaven, it does not mean a specific location. Jesus does not talk about that. Yes, the Bible mentions about the kingdom of heaven, but very little. Well, 90, 98 or 99% of the Bible mentions that already existing kingdom of God here on earth. It talks about this world that is governed by God. This is what Jesus was talking about. The Pharisees said, where is heaven? I think I'm going to preach about this two days later. Anyhow, they said that they cannot see it. I'm going to share what it means to have in you. Going to heaven takes only 1% of our Christian life in terms of ap applicable aspect. The reality of our Christian life is that 99% of the Bible talks about God's presence in our lives. It is purely by God's grace that we confess and believe that Jesus became our Savior and Lord. Therefore, my name is recorded in the book of life by God's grace. It is the greatest gift by God. And here we are to proclaim that amazing grace. Hallelujah. So what does that mean? We are all promised to go to heaven. That is assurance we have. Yes, assurance encourages and comforts us when we go through struggles. However, we do not live to go to heaven because it is already guaranteed for us. We are, all, we are going to go there. So the Bible does not say, does not pay too much attention or interest to it. So the Bible says do not pay too much attention or interest to it. The gospel is about how God's presence is portrayed through the believers, and gets accomplished and achieved through Jesus being the center of our lives. The gospel message teaches us to live for that, to desire for that. Jesus came down on earth, died on the cross, resurrected, defeated all evil, and ascended to heaven all because of that. Gospel-centered life is living for his kingdom. And that is what 99% of the Bible teaches us repeatedly. But when we think about heaven, a place where we will go after we die, yes, it does exist. However, the books of the Gospels teaches us otherwise. This is what the Korean churches missed out or failed to teach. This caused us to be ignorant of how we should live as Christians in this world. 
the purpose of living faithful life is not to go to heaven. We are already saved. God's intention was different. In the book of Genesis, God says to flourish and have dominion over all things. We are called to establish the kingdom of God in the culture that we live in. Instead, we build a wall and separate the church from the world. So the believers cannot learn the truth through church. You will realize later that our church is closed to the world. That there is a thick fence dividing us from the world. That is not being holy. Holy is not being inside the church. We can be holy in the world. If Jesus does not dictate my life, I can run a church according to the worldly standards, even though I'm a pastor. I share with you a story of a couple who sells tteokbokki, uh, Korean rice cake, in front of a bar before. They live a more holy life than any Christian that I have ever seen. Because they know that the truth, what the truth is, and the purpose of their life. God is not looking for that kind of pastor. But he's looking for an individual like that woman who sells tteokbokki. This is bringing the kingdom of God here on earth. Why then did Matthew use the phrase kingdom of heaven, Uranos? Why did he confuse us to think that heaven is a place to go after death and make us focus on that? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves today. The reason is simple. Pastor Yong Gu Yang stated the reason in his book. How can we understand the kingdom of God? Before I present what he said, I want to introduce Pastor Yang to you. He's a renowned author. He studied abroad in England and read many books or teachings about the kingdom of God and had a passion to share what he learned to Christians in Korea. His books influenced and affected many people. One of them is Pastor Um, who grew up in church but lived under low self-esteem, experienced freedom through Pastor Yang's books. Now Pastor Um travels around to give his testimony. The reason is very simple. Pastor Yang states in his book that the audience of the book of Matthew was Jewish people. He concentrated on the gospel message to be preached to the people of Jews. But the audience of Mark and Luke were not Jews. Their audiences were the Gentiles. I mentioned before that the audiences of John were the Greeks. These are the differences. The Holy Spirit gave them the same motive and conviction to declare Jesus' teachings, but they wrote with respect for their audience's culture. I will say once again that Matthew wrote the phrase the kingdom of heaven considering his Jewish audience's culture and circumstances at that time. What does this mean? To Jews, generation after generation, the Mosaic law was of utmost importance, especially the first three. They kept these laws as if their life depended on them. Not keeping these laws meant blasphemy to God. They put Jesus to death because he said that he is the son of God. This is the extent of their value of the law. They accused Jesus of calling God's name in vain and committing blasphemy against God. All because Jesus said he is the son of God. Calling God's name, Yahweh or Elohim, was not permitted in the Jewish culture. This was something unthinkable. So they needed a substitution to call God. They used two substitute words, Adonai, meaning my Lord, and Uranus, meaning heaven, referring to God. Many biblical scholars attest that these two words, Adonai and Uranus, referred to God. They were used when people called God. When you read Luke chapter 15, it tells a story about the prodigal son. When he returned to his father's house after nothing was left to him, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He sinned against his earthly father and against heaven, which means God. So when you say you have sinned against Oranos, heaven, it is commonly understood in Jewish culture that you have sinned against God. This is why Matthew used the word Oranos, because he could not say God, Theos. But Mark, Luke, and John were able to say Theos, be God, because they were speaking to Gentiles. The true heaven of the true meaning of heaven means God. 
we have to change our mindset of heaven. It's okay to desire to go to heaven one day. However, if you're omitting the 99% of Jesus' teachings, then there is a problem. When we only focus on that, everything that we do becomes very limited and becomes legalistic. Then we miss the important aspect of our Christianity. Our life should show the gospel message. Our life should show our faith. One can think, oh, that's only for people who have good or strong faith. I just need to go to heaven by believing in Christ. That's why there are so many churches and churches teaching heresy. One of them is a salvation sect. They focus on when you were saved. Because they believe that once you have the assurance of salvation, you can act whatever you want since you are already saved. That is why they are heresy. The problem lies because Christ, many Christians think like them. They think since their sins are forgiven and saved, that they can live however they want with, the, with their lives. They make compromises and have their own interpretation of the Bible. If we find ourselves the same as them, then we need to repent. But there is no repentance. You only act holy in church, but everywhere else you are not. Chinese characters use two characters to describe heaven, Chun Dang. Chun means sky and Dang means home. Koreans use Chun Dang and Chungguk interchangeably when referring, when referring to heaven. So many are mistaken for Chun Dang, which has Chinese meaning of heaven, and Chungguk, which means heaven in Korean Bible. The Korean translation Bible does not mention Chun Dang. It only says Chungguk as heaven which is the correct translation of the meaning of heaven. The purpose of God's grace for us to live a gospel-centered life, the guidance or example is the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer. If Korean churches did not neglect this idea, they probably would have been used powerfully as a salt and light of the world. Prior to the 1980s, the focus was health and wealth gospel. You believe in Jesus and you will receive great blessings. It also focused on the afterlife. Korea was so poor before and suffered a lot under Japanese occupation, communism, Korean War, and much more. Many kept their faith despite oppression and were killed because of that. It is a true blessing and is grace that their faith was able to pass down to the next generation. Korea's economy boomed after the 1980s and a lifestyle changed in Korea. Now, the Christians focused on becoming rich and to make more money. Many believe in Jesus to get blessings to have the riches of the world. I am not saying that going to good colleges or getting a good job or making a lot of money is a bad thing. Yes, they are all blessings from God. But what is God's purpose of providing those blessings to you? It's definitely not going to heaven with all your riches. You go empty handed. What does the sermon what does the Sermon on the Mount teach us? To store your treasures in heaven. Because all treasure on earth will perish. I think the churches in Korea were used by God greatly. If they realized this, to open up the world and live for the kingdom of God. To open up to the world and live for the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, they missed out. The part of Jesus being the Lord over our lives, focus too much on the afterlife. This is why we have to go back to the gospel message and repent. Head knowledge does not count. God's kingdom is revolution. It changes all our thoughts and opinions. It is impossible without the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to repent and changes us through repentance. I pray and hope that you and I will come to a repentance by reflecting on today's message. So that instead of working around heaven, we will go after our death. That we will think about heaven, God and His will, how it can affect and change my attitude wherever I am. May we have a heart that seeks God to reign over us so that He can proclaim His kingdom through us and perform His wondrous work in us and through us. Amen.